All right, ladies and gentlemen, our next session is a conversation featuring the Foreign Minister of Slovakia, Miroslav Lajcek, with my good friend moderating, uh, Peter Van Praag, President of the Halifax International Security Forum. Peter. David, thank you so much. And um, I just want to welcome the minister here to uh, Tbilisi. I want to begin. It's my last opportunity. Um, so I just want to again um, recognize and thank Mrs. Cindy McCain for her leadership. I want to um, again recognize the incredible contributions to the United States, to the world, and to the Republic of Georgia, Senator John McCain, um, the McCain Institute for bringing us all here today, and, and Nino um, for organizing such an incredible couple of days. It's just been uh, a really important and meaningful um, conversations here in Tbilisi today. Um, this morning, we have the privilege of talking with the longtime minister of Slovakia, Minister Lajcek, welcome. Um, I want to, uh, we, we just had a conversation about Ukraine and the conversations today are not uh, focused on Georgia, but everything is relevant to Georgia, but I wanted to talk a little bit at the outset about your own country. Um, President Chaputova has been hailed by many as something of an antidote to the populist insurgency. She has spoken out against elite corruption and bad behavior, while she has not adopted populist approaches to minorities and other such matters. Down the road from you, in Budapest, Viktor Orban's Hungary was downgraded this year by Freedom House as to only partly free. It's the first time that this has happened to an EU country. If you could share with us, maybe, at the outset of this conversation, what Slovakia seems to be find, how Slovakia seems to be finding the right answers on populism, while Hungary and other countries are finding the wrong ones. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me. And uh, yes, I agree uh, with you that the election of President uh, Zuzana Chaputova has uh, made global news. And normally when a country like mine produces global news, it's something negative, but this was not the case uh, this time. And I uh, went a couple of days after her election to Washington DC. Everybody was speaking about it. Everybody was uh, asking me about her. Then I went to Kyrgyzstan, and everybody was speaking about her again. So th this was really a, a global news. She was really good. I mean, she started uh, the campaign as someone who was little known, but she was extremely credible, convincing, good communicator. She was not afraid of speaking about issues that are not popular in our society, and, and standard politicians would not dare to touch upon these issues like same-sex marriages, for example. But she, she, she presented her views in a way that she was credible. And uh, yeah, another good news was that we had two good candidates in the second round of the presidential elections because her challenger was also pro-EU uh, person. So I'm, I'm really happy with the outcome. If you ask me why, I would say three things. First. Uh, Slovakia already had its share of being a black sheep. During the years of Prime Minister Mečiar, we were labeled by Madeleine Albright uh, the black hole on the map of Europe, and we, we still remember that. Uh, so we, we started our accession, a real process of integration with EU and NATO uh, two years after our neighbors, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary. We wanted to make sure that uh, we will no, never again be the black hole or the black sheep. We are now the only Eurozone member from the Visegrad four countries, so the level of our integration is the highest possible. So we are a pro-EU pro country, and uh, we don't want to, to go back to, to those times. Second, very active, very influential civil society and, and free media. And, 
and in the development of my country, I can say that these are the elements that, that make the free society. And no one, I mean, you cannot, I mean, uh, get away with murder because the, the, the civil society and the media will make it very clear that uh, this will not happen. So they are creating an atmosphere that was conducive to this election. And third, Slovakia, after the murder of Jan Kuci again and his fiancée is a different country. So this was also the, the continuation of, of the new movement when our people make it very clear that they want a different kind of politics and different kind of politicians. Thank you, thank you for that. There's, there's a lot in there to unpack actually. I, I and, and we'll give an opportunity for, um, for people to ask questions. This year, 2019, you are the chair of the OSCE, um, which is a co convenient uh, commute um, as well, um, from Bratislava to Vienna. Um, if I could just tell you, this, this country, uh, Georgia, I'll turn a little bit to this region, um, um, and other countries in the region, um, take the OSCE's uh, work, um, specifically with regard to elections, ODIR's work, very seriously. It's very important as, a, as part of the international community. Um, and I'm wondering, this past presidential election, Odir was critical. Um, and maybe you can comment a little bit on that, on how Odir will be watching the fulfillment of some of the recommendations it made following the election. Yes, uh, one of many good features about the OSC is uh, uh, the role OSC and ODIR in particular plays in monitoring the elections. And, and, and their electoral assessment is uh, something that is accepted by other international organizations and we are very proud of it. And it's not only the monitoring but also the assistance to the participating states in adjusting their electoral legislation. And this was the key recommendation that ODIR issued after the presidential elections, namely the suggestions of a comprehensive review of electoral legislation. Uh, and there are, well, one has to say also that uh, according to the ODIR uh, report, the elections were free, they were competitive, they were basically minor problems, so there was no question about the legitimacy uh, of, of, the, of the electoral process, but yes, uh, it would be good to review the overall uh, electoral legislation, and uh, I know that the country already started discussions about it. I would like to encourage the Georgian authorities to use the expertise of ODIR, and of course to uh, waste no time, because there is a good tradition that you do not really change the electoral legislation in the electoral year, so we do not have that much time left, but uh, if there is a genuine will, and I, I have no reason to have any doubts about it, then we can proceed rather quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, let's turn a little bit to the European Union and uh, the European Union's commitment to, to the Eastern Partnership. Is there what is the status of the Eastern Partnership? What is, in your view, as a long-serving minister, um, the EU's commitment at this juncture to Georgia? I come from the country that believes in uh, Eastern Partnership project, and we have invested lots of uh, energy and lots of political capital in promoting the Eastern Partnership uh, process. Uh, we have now commemorated 10 years since uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, policy of the European Union was launched. I'm glad to say that Georgia is the front runner. Uh, right now it's the leader among the six countries of the Eastern Partnership. It's also true that uh, as of today, uh, Georgia has achieved everything the Eastern Partnership has offered. So it's uh, enjoying the, the visa-free visa regime, of course the uh, association agreement and the DCFTA. Uh, so we are basically 
there is nothing else left that the European Union will be offering at this point. We've had over the years uh, different stages of discussions about the Eastern Partnership. But I must say I was pleasantly surprised by the quality of the discussion when we were really thinking about what next. And there was not a single voice saying this should be it. Uh, forget about Eastern Partnership. You know, uh, actually, when it comes to the enlargement, when it comes to the countries that were given the European perspective, they have more reasons to be frustrated right now because uh, there are voices, important voices from the European Union saying, not now, we need to focus on our own, own internal consolidation. But this is not the case with the Eastern Partnership. We, uh, the discussion was extremely constructive and uh, we were trying to identify what is the space between what the countries have already uh, received from us and the membership, which is not on, on the table for now. And there is a plenty. Uh, most importantly, the de facto cooperation, uh, participation on particular concrete programs of the European Union. So that let's talk less about the final outcome, about the status, and let's focus more on practical cooperation and practical involvement everywhere where it is possible. And of course, support for the reforms, including the financial support. But uh, I, I, I'm glad to say that the European Union is pretty united on this and pretty committed to continue working further with our Eastern partners. And uh, so, but obviously the speed of the process and the final outcome of, of the whole poli policies is in, in the hands of our Eastern partners because they have to prove that greater level of engagement is in the interest of the European Union. That means they are contributing to solving to our problems rather than expecting us to solve their problems. At the same time, having said that, I also have to say that European Union stays loyal to, to Georgia. Uh, our policy when it comes to the territorial integrity of Georgia within its internationally recognized border is very clear. Our engagement with Georgia uh, in different uh, international uh, levels is, is uh, very frequent. I also want to appreciate the fact that, that Georgia aligns itself with the foreign policy views and foreign policy statements of, of the European Union on a regular ba basis. And European Union is the main uh, international player when it comes to uh, dealing with, the, with, the, with the, 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 the Georgian challenges, which is, uh, of course, the, the Russian occupation of 20% of, of, uh, of Georgian territory. So we have the EU monitoring mission we have the Genera, G Geneva informal discussions, we, we have the IPRM, so EU is in the lead and uh, maybe there is a feeling in, in this country that more should be done, uh, but uh, we are consistent. We are consistent and there is no risk of uh, Georgian problems being forgotten because of other problems. Okay, thank you, Minister. We're going to open up now for questions. Um, if people have, um, and I think we'll take, I think we have a little bit of time, so we'll just do, yep, at the back, do we have microphones? Thank you very much. My name is Mikhail Mirziashvili. I'm, I'm from the uh, Center of Democracy and Development. Uh, my question is regarding the Eastern Partnership. The uh, uh, speaker said that uh, uh, Georgia received all benefits that was offered in the frame of the Eastern Partnership, uh, meaning the visa you know, free regime, uh, association agreement, the CFTA, etc. Uh, but the Eastern Partnership also includes the cooperation not only with EU, in, uh, in the case of Georgia, also cooperation with other member of the Eastern Partnership initiative, uh, member countries like Ukraine, Moldova. <clears throat> in the previous session, there was mention in cooperation with Ukraine and coordination. How you evaluated the, uh, was that fulfilled the, this uh, part of the Eastern Partnership uh, 
uh, by the member countries uh, when we are talking about cooperation among the members, like not excluding EU. Thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, when we were looking back at the experience from the first 10 years of Eastern Partnership, ex this area exactly was identified as the one where we could do more and we can do more. Uh, we also want to see Eastern Partnership as a project that is bringing these six countries together, or particularly the three out of the six that really believe in an European integration, European future. Uh, up until now, the countries were rather focusing on their individual cooperation with the European Union. So EU supports and promotes greater level of cooperation uh, and coordination uh, among the countries, uh, among the Eastern partners. Uh, and obviously, with, based on European values, on European pr principles, and on European goals. So uh, this is something we want to see more of uh, in the second stage of the Eastern Partnership. Um, uh, yes, right here. I think there's a microphone on your left, yep. Um, Nina Biashuli, this is for European Studies of Tulsa State University. I think the question of this, um, the main motto of this con conference now, what is again most relevant here on this panel? Because you mentioned that um, Georgia and other uh, three, um, other two members of the Eastern Partnership have achieved almost everything what could be achieved within the frames of Eastern Partnership. And still the membership is too early, as it seems from the um, rhetoric of high officials um, and yourself on, on these panels. So now what? What, what are the options? Because um, in the academic literature, there are lots of reviews of possible options and there's of discussions about neighborhood economic community, which could be another step, which could approximate us towards European Union. And, um, but still, this is not membership. But there are other options beyond this uh, widely discussed neighborhood economic uh, whatever project. Nick, thank you. Thank you again. Nino, thank you. I'm, essentially, her question is the name of the conference, which is now what? And um, I mean, really, how long does the EU expect countries, how patient should countries be? We, there's a large country, much larger than this country, that borders this country to its immediate west, that uh, called Turkey. And um, there was optimism about Turkish, Turkish membership to the EU, and now there's no optimism. And uh, one side blames one side, blames the other side, the other side blames the other side. And so how long should uh, young people like Nino be, be waiting? My vision of the European Union is uh, the EU, which is clearly a global player. EU that uh, is an example of uh, political stability and, and uh, economic development and protection of, of rights, human rights and other rights. Europe that leads by example, but also European Union that is a global player, that means is also aware of its global responsibility. And this last element was missing in, in the behavior of the European Union lately, and I, 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 I personally believe it's a mistake. Uh, obviously, it was a mistake for the President of the Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, to say in his inaugural speech there will be no enlargement in coming five years. Uh, we, we knew there will be no enlargement uh, because it was not possible technically, but you are sending a message of discouraging the countries that believe in, in the European future. So I want to see European Union that is really actively engaging with like-minded countries, countries who believe in European ideals and European values. And what I want to say is that now is the time to influence the program priorities of the new commission. Uh, this is exactly the moment when a number of uh, think tanks uh, and thinkers are presenting their suggestions to, uh, and asking to be taken on board when the new program and new priorities of the new commission will be, will be presented. What is extremely important is that you do not position yourself as, I'm your problem, how are you going to deal with me? Because then the, the, the reaction would be, thank you, we have enough problems on our own. You have to say, I'm part of your solution. I am the m going to multiply your message. I'm going to multiply your values. 
how can I be useful to you? And there are, as I said, there are so many th ways in, in which we can do that. So right now it's really about living by European standards, European principles. And here I want to mention particular rule of law and corruption. These are the things that European Union is extremely sensitive about, and not only when it comes to future members, but also when it comes to current members. So you have to, to demonstrate that you are not bringing future problems into the European, into the European project, into the European family. And, and there, are, there are many, many opportunities to work closely with the European Union on a number of issues on a daily basis. And this needs to be done so that you will not be seen as strangers, as an external element, but more and more to be, uh, to be considered a part of the family. You know, when in NATO, Partnership for Peace program was uh, launched, it was meant to be an alternative to the membership. But it was the partners, including our countries, who made this program basically a, a path towards the membership. Mm -hmm. So if we were only waiting and complaining, we would never en be ending up as members of NATO. So that's why I want to encourage all those who believe in European Georgia to engage with the European Union and to show that you can, you can contribute and you can be part of the solutions of, of the issues EU is dealing with. Nino, does that satisfy you? Okay. At the back, we'll take a, th a few questions uh, at the same time. So there's a microphone here, then we'll go to the back. Um, yep. Um, thank you, George Mjellishvili, International Black University, Tbilisi. Um, the issue of cooperation between Eastern partners has been featuring oh, heavily over the last two sessions. In this uh, regard, my question is about Visegrad Group, of which Slovakia was a member. To what extent membership in the Visegrad facilitated the realization of your dream of joining NATO European Union, and what lessons can be taken aboard for our countries? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. Nika Chitadze, a professor of the International Black University. With your permission, I have the, the question uh, related to the energy security of Slovakia and European Union in general, because we know that you, despite the sanctions against the Russian Federation, uh, you consume about 200 billion cubic meters of uh, natural gas uh, for, uh, imported from the Russian Federation. There are countries which are dependent for 20 or 30 percent, like Germany, or 100 percent, like uh, Slovakia. It was before, yes, uh, uh, on the uh, natural gas from Russian Federation. As I know, that uh, they have been uh, done some steps from the Slovakian and other countries side to decrease uh, this uh, uh, dependence on Russian Federation. What are the the next steps and what is going on here and uh, what, what is a policy of um, Slovakia and your partner countries, for example, from Visegrad Group, related to the decreasing the energy dependence from Russian Federation. Thank you very much. Thank you. You got those? You, you got, uh, let's let's yeah. stay with two so to yeah. make sure that we yeah. will not no, forget. That, that's, and it. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. No, then we can go further. But uh, well, I, First on Visegrad sure. 4, uh, Visegrad 4 has played an extremely useful role in bringing our four countries towards the membership in the EU and NATO, because uh, these four countries are very close by their history, by the, the level of economic development. It was very easy for us to harmonize our positions. And uh, obviously, when four countries speak with one voice, then they, sp they, they speak way louder than when they do it individually. We were able to coordinate our position on, on crucial issues. And at the same time, the philosophy of the V4 was that this is not an organization which is not consensus based. So every time we are unable to reach an, an, a common position, that's a reality, it's not a drama. We, we were not twisting each other's arms for that. But, uh, but most of the cases we were able and, uh, and, and it, it really helped. Uh, initially, V4 was designed to be a vehicle to get us to the EU and NATO and it was sort of expected that after we have reached these strategic goals, there will be no longer need for it, we check that for it. But we prove that this is, this is, the opposite is the true because it really helps. It also, to, to make our, our views and our positions, uh, I mean, heard, we coordinate our, our, our position, not against, but in favor of, uh, of presenting our, we four countries are the countries that uh, brought 
their own authentic experience, successful transition, uh, well-performing economies, uh, greater level of sensitivity towards Eastern partners, towards Western Balkans. So all these are the things that EU should be benefiting from. Right now, uh, the image of the Visegrad 4 is not very positive because of, uh, you know what, some rhetoric, some actions from some of the members. But again, w let's not dismiss the entire project because of this. Uh, we just finished our uh, presidency and we, uh, Slovakia, and, and right now the, it's the Czech Republic that is holding the presidency and we both agree that we are going to use these two years to polish the image of the Visegrad 4 and to prove that uh, we are part of the solution, not part of the problem. So I would s definitely recommend you to team up with the countries uh, like Ukraine, like Moldova uh, in, in the first place and every time you, you can come present and present a common position, it will make your case strong. When it comes to the energy security, yes, the truth is that uh, Slovakia is practically 100% dependent on, on Russia's uh, gas and oil. And up until 2009, uh, until the first uh, energy crisis, we believe that uh, we are in a safe place because we are a major uh, transit country. So uh, the, the, the gas and oil do, do, does not end in Slovakia, and therefore we believe that uh, well, it, it will be protected. It was not. So uh, since 2009, we have uh, taken a number of measures and precautions to make sure that we are not vulnerable. Uh, first of all, we've built uh, the interconnectors with, with other networks, uh, connecting with, with, uh, with Austria, with uh, Hungary, and we are act completing the north-south uh, uh, pipeline from Svinovšče in Poland until Krk. In, in Croatia, that means uh, there will always be enough gas on the market. Uh, the LNG from the United States is more and more of a factor here, and we will be able, if needed, to get uh, the gas from, from other suppliers. At the same time, we are actively opposing the Nord Stream 2 project because we believe that uh, this is the project which is uh, economically not needed and politically dangerous, uh, strategically very dangerous for Ukraine. And I, I do believe that the idea behind this project is basically to, to marginalize Ukraine's role as a tra transitor of energy. And of course, then uh, oh, uh, it's e much easier to manipulate with Ukraine in many other ways. And uh, uh, it looks like uh, the, the pro project is going to to become a reality and uh, many of our partners don't want to see the political ele element in it that they, they claim it's a, a standard business project which is not but uh, in the meantime we also made sure that ukraine first of all uh, that, that the ukrainian system will continue to be in use and second that ukraine can also receive uh, the, uh, the gas from the from the west we build the interconnector the, uh, providing the reverse gas flow for Ukraine, so we gave Ukraine the energy independence. Minister, I'm afraid we are out of time. I, um, I think that we covered a lot of material, um, and it goes by quick. That was quick. I know, it goes by quick. Um, but I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for your service as well. Um, we don't know, we've been watching your career closely, and uh, we know that there'll be uh, we'll be following you into the future, and we'll all be looking at uh, what's next for Miroslav Lychek. So uh, thank you very much, and, um, and David, I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Miroslav, Peter, thank you very much.